Hey guys, welcome to another episode of From the Luthier's Workbench brought to you by Highline Guitars. If you like building or repairing electric guitars, I encourage you to tap that subscribe button down below. And if you do, I'll take your luthier skills to a whole new level. In this episode, I'll be covering part eight of the Steampunk Guitar Build. And that means I'm going to be prepping the body and neck for paint. Now, if you'd like to go back and watch the previous seven episodes in this series, I'm going to be including a link at the end of this video to a playlist that I've created. So stay with me and let's get started. Now, early on in this project, I had decided that I was going to paint this guitar with metallic paints. And I wasn't really sure which metallic paints I was going to use. So I decided I was going to have to conduct some tests. And what I did was I ran over to my local big box craft store and I purchased as many of the metallic paints as I could find. And I've got, I've got some deco art. I've got craft smart. I've got dazzling metallics, which is also from deco art. And that's pretty much what I was of oh, folk art. And that was pretty much all I was able to get. I think because of this pandemic of 2020, the uh, store shelves I've noticed are starting to get kind of bare. And when I walked down the aisle where they sell these paints, <laughs> there was a lot of empty shelf space. So I managed to find a few samples and I've got like two different types of silver, two different kinds of gold, and two different types of the copper. And then what I did was I came home, I mixed these up and sprayed them. I did a couple of test samples just to kind of see how they would perform. Now I think if you were just gonna use these craft store type paints by themselves, you'd probably be fine with any of them. They, they all perform basically about the same. However, I also had an opportunity to test these products against Crystal Lax, Craftneek, uh, water-based metallic pigments. Now these products require you to mix them into a carrier. And in this case, I'm using uh, Crystal Lax Bright Tone Clear Gloss. And so you mix a small amount into the clear gloss, maybe add a little bit of a viscosity reducer to get the viscosity where it needs to be in order to spray it. And then I applied those. Now, what I ended up discovering is that the Craftnique performs far, far better than any of the $2 craft store metallic water-based paints that I tried. And unfortunately, I don't think you can really see it, but you know, here's a pretty good example. This is the craft store water-based acrylic silver metallics. And then this is the crystal lac. Now I just slapped these on. I didn't really pay close attention to my application process. But this looks like silver. This looks like gray. And that was kind of the impression I got from all of the craft store metallics. They just don't have the color that I was looking for. So what I have decided I'm going to do is I'm going to spray this guitar using just the Crystal Lac Craftneek Metallics. And I'm pretty confident these are going to perform better than what I would have accomplished using these craft store water-based metallics. And that being said, I think if you were just to test these by themselves without having an opportunity to try the the Crystal Lac Craftneek pigments, you might be pretty satisfied with how these perform, but compared to the Craftneek, I really feel the Craftneek does a far better job. So yeah, that's the direction I think I'm going to go. Now it does of course require that you do some mixing up and that sort of thing, but it's really not all that difficult to do. And because we're using the Bright Tone as the carrier, Bright Tone is a high solids polyurethane, and once it's dried and cured, it is much harder and more durable than the acrylic um, 
metallic products are. So that's one of the added benefits to it. Now, before I start to apply these products to the guitar, you know, as I said at the beginning of this video, I'm going to do some final sanding and some grain filling and that sort of thing. But then what I'm going to do is I'm going to spray a black, a flat black primer because metallics really look great when you spray them over a black um, primer coat. So uh, let's jump in and, and start getting this body ready for paint. Now for the most part this guitar has already been sanded and is ready for finish. Uh, I brought it to about 220 grit and I showed that a couple of episodes ago. So the only thing I really want to do now is I want to address this little edge where the neck meets the body. Now, this one's a little bit sharp. So I'm going to take my Japanese Iwasaka file here and I'm just going to round this over. And I'll take some 220 grit sandpaper. I also have some glue squeeze out here, which I need to address. Yeah, that's pretty good. Okay, now I do have kind of an interesting predicament. Now this is something I was aware of early on as I was planning this build. And I had to think of different possible scenarios to address it. I'm going to be leaving this area the natural wood finish as well as this area here. And then I'm going to have different shades of silver, copper, and gold in these different sections. But this section here will be copper. This section here will be silver. So where they meet up, I need to put a line of delineation, I guess. So what I'm going to do is I've cut a shallow groove where those colors are going to meet. And that kind of mimics the, uh, the grooves I have here. Now what this also means is the neck, you know, because you've got copper and silver, that means logically one half of the neck would be silver and the other half would be copper, which I think will look really cool. But how do I address where those two colors meet? Since the rest of the guitar, the, the colors are separated by these seams, it would make sense to have a seam that would run the length of the neck. But of course, you're gonna, you would feel that. Well, there's a couple of ways I could deal with that. One is I could airbrush a faux seam, or I could actually cut a seam. Maybe not as deep as the ones that are in the body, but one that's there nevertheless. And I think that's what I'm going to do, because it's not going to be terribly deep, and I will still be applying my black primer, my color coats, and then finally my finish coat. So I think what I can do is after I've applied the color coats is I can, if there's any left that, you know, and there should be that I can see, I can fill that in with some clear epoxy and then uh, apply my clear coats over the top. So you'll see the seam, but you won't be able to feel it. And then I can carry that on up into the uh, headstock as well all the way around, both the front and the back of it. So uh, that ought to be kind of interesting. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mark out the position of this seam like that. And then up at the headstock, it would be right smack in the middle. And I can eyeball this. I'm, I'm pretty good about that. And this is just to help me see where the scribe line will need to be. Draw it like so, and then I would transfer down the side. 
So this side would be copper up here, and this side would be silver. So then when you flip it over, go like this, and I want it to run right into the center of the slot for adjusting the truss rod because there will be a cover that comes to a point. All right, so now what I got to do is scribe that line. Start by doing this part by hand, and I'm using my X-Acto knife because I can get the essence of a groove formed And then I'll come back in and beef it up with my with this little micro file. One more pass. Then I'll move up to this end and continue it. Since this guitar body is made out of alder, which even though it's considered a hardwood, it's just barely a hardwood. You know, it's only slightly harder than pine. So what I want to do is I want to enhance the surface durability, and that means its resistance to scratches and dings. And to do that, I'm going to be applying Z-Poxy finishing resin over the surface. Now this is a two-part resin, just like your typical epoxies, but it has a much thinner viscosity, so it's easy to apply and spread out over the surface. The first coat will be applied and then allowed to soak in and dry, which takes about five to six hours for it to fully dry and cure. Then I'll apply a second coat in exactly the same manner. I'll let that dry and cure, and then I'll apply a third coat. And once I've finished with that third coat, the surface is going to be significantly more durable than it would have been if I had just left it alone. And at that point, I can start to apply my base color and then my metallic paints over the top of that. And that's going to happen in Episode 9.